The Hollywood we know today is truly awful. It's a monolithic machine that swallows up creativity and talent, driven by the greed of a few at the expense of the many. But simply making money or entertaining the masses aren't the only things that the movie studios are designed to accomplish. Hollywood's hidden purpose is to act as the greatest, most effective propaganda machine that's ever been created. Propaganda and government messaging are built into the very fabric of Hollywood, and it's been there from the beginning. But a little over 100 years ago, Hollywood was just an unremarkable patch of land on the outskirts of LA, but just a decade later, and it would become the seat of power for a film empire. The eight studios that came out of Hollywood were responsible for 95% of movies shown in theaters during 1930 and 1948. This was the definition of a true monopoly, but every empire begins with a conqueror, and Hollywood was no different. And the people who defined Hollywood all of these years ago are responsible for the propaganda movies we see today, spread throughout all cinemas, including even movies like Barbie. But to understand why, we need to understand the man behind it all, Louis B. Mayer. Now, Louis Mayer was a man who came from nothing. Born in Russia in the late 1800s, Louis came to the US as the son of a penniless immigrant. It was a hard and cruel life. Louis was forced to drop out of school at age 12, all in order to help his father sell scrap metal by the roadside. His days consisted of long hours spent walking the streets, scavenging any junk worth selling. But on the rare occasion that Louis did have time to spare, he would spend it all at the local theater. And it was there, watching live shows from the stands, that he fell in love with performing arts. It became his only goal in life to break into the entertainment business, but it wasn't going to be easy. Louis spent years working tirelessly for his father's business, saving what little money he could and teaching himself to read, write and speak English, as well as everything else that he needed to run a business. By 1907, and had gathered just enough savings to buy an abandoned burlesque house in Haverhill, Massachusetts. Over the course of a few years, he renovated the rundown building and turned it into a cinema. Even at his young age, Louis' business genius was becoming apparent. I mean, to clean up the reputation of this building, for example, he only showed religious and family films at first. Instead of targeting the richer citizens of Haverhill, he tapped into the uncontested poorer neighborhoods, making films accessible to everyone. And because of this, his business exploded. Within just a few years, Louis owned all five of the cinemas in the city. And a few years later, he was at the head of the largest chain of cinemas and theaters in New England. Even before Hollywood though, Louis B. Mayer wasn't concerned about getting involved with propaganda and pushing a message for profit. In 1914, he bought the exclusive rights to show the movie The Birth of a Nation for $25,000, around $750,000 in today's money. Infamous today, the wildly racist movie was what made his career. His backing of what amounted to a Ku Klux Klan recruitment movie turned out to be ludicrously profitable, and Louis was able to quadruple his investment. And this summed up Louis. Morals aside, he would do everything in his grasp to grow and expand his empire. He would then use all the money he made from the birth of a nation to found a talent agency in New York, and then an entire production company which he built in a small town called Hollywood. In a very short space of time, ruthless businessmen like Louis B. Mayer bought out and consolidated every part of the movie business. He later founded MGM, which grew to be the largest of the studios. The others were Paramount, Fox, Warner, and RKO. Throughout the 20s, they built their own sets in Hollywood, and they broadcast the films they made through their own distribution networks and cinemas. And soon, Louis B. Mayer was about to strike gold. As the end of the 20s neared, and 1929 began, the Great Depression would take over America and spread across the world, destroying entire industries overnight, leaving millions of people unemployed. And yet one of the only industries to succeed in this time was the movie business. You see, as people were desperate for a distraction, Hollywood was able to provide a never-ending supply. However, the movies that were shown weren't only distractions. The studios themselves made Hollywood into a brand. A promise that you could escape your life and become a star. Thousands of young women made the journey, but a minuscule amount ever had a chance. Contracts and jobs were handed out at sleazy parties in return for predatory favors, and the women who did sign had to always give away everything. The studios then got to dictate every aspect of their personal life. They even changed their names. Louis B. Mayer himself was especially controlling, ruling his studio and everyone in it with an iron fist. Judy Garland was just one of his victims who he abused and controlled with a reduced diet and bottles of pills. Because people go to movies not based on the movie, but for the actors in it. And so these big Hollywood studios understood very well the true power that the talent had. So they waged a war of control on them for decades. And it was in this period when Hollywood studios would start to pressure them to push messages, allowing them to make even more money. But they want to they overthrow all governments, even the American government. 
by force and violence. Then we'll overthrow it by force and violence. So when the government came to Hollywood in the 1940s with the measures to be pushed and money to be given, it was an obvious deal. These studio executives were happy to do it, and ostensibly it was for a good cause. The studio executives gave the government full oversight over the business. Between 1942 and 1945, the US military and their Bureau of Motion Pictures reviewed and edited over 1,600 different film scripts, taking out anything that didn't fit into their pro-war message. They pumped out propaganda films by the dozens as well, like the seven-part documentary series Why We Fight designed to rally more and more troops for the Allies' cause. What put us into uniform, ready to engage the enemy on every continent and every ocean? But this was only the beginning. What started in the world wars would progress into a pervasive national campaign of deceit, mental conditioning and propaganda. This quote from Elmer Davis, the head of the Office of War Information during World War II, predicted exactly where this would lead. Quote, The easiest way to inject a propaganda idea into most people's minds is to let it go through the medium of an entertainment picture, when they do not realise that they are being propagandized. So as time went on, Hollywood and the US military got far more subtle and effective with their propaganda. And today, the government's influence over films is even greater than it was back then, and it all stems from the studio executives, the people who control of the money and the power. Whilst the executives of today share lots of similarities with the power-hungry tycoons of the golden age of Hollywood, the way they exert control of the industry now is a little bit different. And so to understand why, we need to understand one of the most successful executives of our time, Bob Iger. Hollywood today is on a downward trajectory. The economy falling and people spending less on movies, it's becoming clear that people are just struggling to justify spending money on expensive items. Especially when it comes to earbuds. People find it hard to justify spending their money for things like AirPods or other overpriced options when you want truly wireless earbuds. And that's why I want to talk to you about today's sponsor, the Everyday Earbuds by Raycon. Raycon is revolutionizing the electronics industry, providing affordable tech, with high quality sound. I mean, when I first tried Raycons, the quality of the sound took me aback. The depth and clarity of songs was astonishing. And by using its features like noise isolation, along with its water resistant build, I was able to fall into my own little world walking outdoors listening to music. In addition, Raycons have eight hours of playtime and 32 hours of life, meaning I could use these all day in the gym or outdoors hiking. And it's not just the great battery life and sound quality with Raycons. You can also use the earbuds tap functions to toggle between three customizable sound profiles noise isolation and awareness mode, and you can pick your Raycons from a range of fun colors and patterns, with no dangling wires or stems. As Snoop Dogg claimed, quote, this is way better than those cords hanging out behind the back of my neck. And Raycon also offers you multiple payment options. You can either buy now or pay later, allowing you to pay as low as $18 at checkout. And now they're also offering you a 30-day free return policy and two years of product protection insurance, just for a few extra bucks. In addition to free domestic shipping, they also ship internationally at a flat fee, with an easy and free return guarantee. So to get yours today, click the link in the description below and go to buyraycom.com forward slash moonyt to get 15% off of your order. He has spent decades working for ABC and Disney, setting the playbook for how to run a modern film studio or media company. And just like Louis B. Mayer, he started out at the bottom as well. Iger was born into a moderately wealthy family, and after getting his bachelor's in TV and radio, he went straight to work. He was desperate to get his foot in the door, and so he started as a weatherman for a local TV station. But Iger would prove that he was excellent at climbing the ladder. He was ambitious driven, and would go extra mile for his bosses. And so after some long months as a weatherman, he eventually pivoted his career, focusing on management instead of being in front of the screen. For that, he joined ABC in the mid-70s, but he had to start from the very bottom. His first job there was literally as an errand boy on the sets for TV shows, fetching people coffee and generally doing the dirty work for $150 a week. But eventually through his persistence, ambition and hard work, he would move up to ABC Sports Wing after two years as a low-level manager. And through continuous innovation, grinding, never relenting, he turned everything he touched into gold. Often underestimated, Iger slowly got given more and more responsibility as he rose up the ranks, and after over a decade, he was given his first big break, the opportunity to manage ABC's coverage of the 1988 Calgary Winter Olympics. His journey hadn't been easy so far. Early on in his career, Iger had been forced out of his post by his boss over some accusations of spreading rumors. He was told he wasn't promotable and that he had two weeks to get another job at ABC or get fired. And it was this that prompted his move to ABC Sports. Once he was there, Iger eventually found himself working under a man called Rune Arlich. It was from him that Iger honed his most important quality, perfection.
perfectionism. Everything had to be absolutely exact, down to the tiniest of details. Anything less was an insult to Arledge, and Igo was one of the only men who could reach his standards. Countless weekends and holidays were spent at work. Igo put it above everything else. He would actually later write in his memoirs that constantly being away from his family was what brought an end to his first marriage. For now though, that just meant making good television. The Winter Olympics weren't going to be any different. Now ABC has spent hundreds of millions bidding for the rights to the Winter Olympics. They were locked in a battle for the number one spot in America's TV, and it was a massive prize. This was hundreds of millions spent on a gamble to clinch first place, and the odds weren't good. The previous Winter Olympics had lost ABC millions after they got poor ratings, and when the event finally did come, it was cursed by awful weather and a fraud controversy over the tickets. But Bob Wagner wasn't going to let his chance at greatness slip away, so instead of floundering and panicking as more and more of the events were delayed or cancelled, he got to work. Iger put much more of his focus on the individual stories and emotionally charged underdogs. He used Eddie the Eagle, a now famous British ski jumper, as an inspirational role model. He wasn't a world class ski jumper, in fact he scored less than half the points of the second last competitor in his events. But Iger used this uniquely British story to make the event unforgettable for the American public. Well, I've been jumping for two years. Go ahead. Other unlikely competitors brought to fame by Iger were the Jamaican bobsled team, with their story eventually inspiring cool runnings. And with all of this innovation and hard work, the Winter Olympics somehow became a smash success, and it propelled Iger's career even further. Bob was then put in charge of ABC's entertainment department a year later, taking them from a third place spot in American TV straight to the top. But as Iger went further up the ladder, he started to lose sight of actual entertainment, because by being a top level executive meant that his priorities were changing over time. Bob was becoming the perfect businessman. Entertainment was just the means to power, and it was around this period that things became interesting. You see, Disney had been buying their own media empire for years, and in 1995, they added ABC to their growing list of conquests. Iger remained in charge of ABC for a few years afterwards, where he continued to excel. So a few years later, he was made chief operating officer and president of Disney itself. Itself. This gave him a spot on Disney's board as the number two man. Then when the CEO at the time, Michael Eisner, was ousted in an internal coup, it was Iger who took the reins of Disney. At ABC, Iger had run into some problems with his overall strategy. He had been quick to jump on an opportunity and maximize his potential, either when he got handed the Winter Olympics or when he championed Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, the show that was a miracle for ABC in the 1990s, getting huge ratings every time it aired. But after a couple years of daily airings, people started getting bored of it. Iger had over exploited the show, and with nothing to replace it, the network slipped from the first place to the fourth. Eventually, Iger stepped away, but not getting demoted, he would eventually be put in charge of Disney itself. And Iger was different from many executives. Bob Iger was the hot rising CEO. CEO. But because he didn't have a good reputation within his company, he had done everything to build up respect, going from a weatherman to a CEO. However, by this point in his career, with this much power, being at the helm of Disney, there was a big issue for Bob Iger. He had never had experience working in films, but now he was completely responsible for what Disney would put production budget behind. However, he would utilize this opportunity, using his experience in business to take a whole new approach to Hollywood. He knew that his new job would be different. Disney's goal had always been to subsume as much of culture as possible. They'd leverage fairy tales and other stories to build their brand. But Iger knew that to really take the company to the top, he needed to grow the empire. And by using his ambition, he would take control of franchises and intellectual properties from all around the world. He'd then go further than that. By controlling so many parts of people's entertainment, he could give Disney unprecedented influence over the way people think and how they live their lives. His plan for Disney was going to perfect this. Over the next two decades, Disney would expand and conquer under Bob Iger. Each of his next decisions can be explained through this lens. And it's how he turned Disney and the rest of Hollywood into one of the biggest propaganda machines history's ever seen. What people think of as propaganda is a century out of date. 100 years ago it meant posters and slogans, but since the war it's evolved. Today's propaganda is about subtle reinforcement and slow pressure. It's about pushing the same message and the same patterns every time in slightly different ways. Making sure that everything people consume fits the guidelines and the overall narrative that you need to push. In Herman and Chomsky's propaganda model, there are five ways the establishment ensures that people hear the correct narrative, and Bob Iger's choices for Disney would perfect all five of them. You see, one of the most important foundations for effective propaganda is centralized ownership of the media and the entertainment business. And Bob Iger's grand strategy for Disney was to expand their influence and grow their ownership as much as possible. And to do this, he bought the companies that showed the most potential for cultural dominance. One of his first acts as CEO was to properly buy out Pixar in 2006 from Steve Jobs, as he knew the studio was at the cutting edge in children's movies and animation. Later on, he would be integral in the Lucasfilm deal, which saw Disney take control of Star Wars, Indiana 
Indiana Jones and all of their other properties. But the best deal he made was his acquisition of Marvel in 2009. The franchise that he made out of that would dominate entertainment for 20 years to come. And as Disney was growing their empire, other companies like Sony, Viacom and Comcast were all busy doing the exact same thing. And together, they would monopolize the movie industry. By keeping production costs high, with film budgets into the hundreds of millions, they could muscle independence out of the market and keep control of the narrative. And for Disney, once they had these franchises, Iger would then get to work on integrating the other four pillars into Disney's business model. One of these pillars is taking your information and story from the government and all the other established structures of power. And it's clearly there if you look at some of the first Marvel movies that Disney released after they had only just bought out the studios. Iron Man 2 is a great example. It's one of the many Marvel movies that had the full support and funding of the US military, as they used real military equipment and the Pentagon funded the movie's production at least in part. They also got to take a look at the script, guide the story the way they wanted, and scrub anything they didn't like. And so the result was a movie where Iron Man's best friend and Air Force officer helps him defeat a Russian who stole their military technology. At the beginning of the film, Tony is against giving the US control of his technology, and it's what causes the conflict of the movie. He abuses his power until the government, represented by S.H.I.E.L.D., steps in to save the day. Other Marvel movies under Iger follow a similar formula. The US government is nearly always portrayed in a positive light. Often a question is asked about their policies, but it's nearly always resolved in their favour. In fact, these movies offer a straw manner of these arguments, which they can then later overcome. In Black Panther, for example, the movie makes a case against imperialism and the US's role on the world stage. But the villain is the one who pushes this narrative and fights for the people, before he's even proven wrong. One of the main characters is a CIA agent as well, whose intervention in a foreign government ends in peace and prosperity. By doing these things, Iger perfected the Disney model of cultural control. He identified which franchises and properties would become culturally important in the next decades, and would then use them to spread Disney's brand of marketable heroes and cozy conformity. And it made the company and Iger personally monstrously rich. In 2006, one of his first years at the top of the company, Iger finally achieved his dream and was paid $25.9 million. And it would only rise from there. The franchises he bought made Disney billions. His $4 billion deal for Marvel in 2009 paid itself off within five years, 10 years later, and has made Disney over $18 billion. Iger was at the top of his game. All of his ambitions over the last decades had finally come to fruition. But just like at ABC, it wouldn't last forever. Over time, he started to neglect the franchises that had made Disney their billions, focusing on other parts of the business instead. Just like Disney's legal department, another pillar of modern propaganda. Chomsky calls this flack. It's the ability to punish and deter any attempts to challenge the status quo and deviate from the norms. Disney buys up portions of culture, molds them in their own sanitized image, then goes after anyone breaking their copyrights or messing with the story. Under Iger, Disney's legal department is the best paid in the world. Their new legal chief who was hired last year was paid over $15 million in salary. One of Chomsky's last pillars of modern propaganda is the network of advertisers and people looking to sell a product. They interfere and censor anything that's truly controversial because it might turn people away from buying merchandise. The goal is simply light entertainment, something that puts people at ease and makes them interested enough to open up their wallet. And as they get their claws into a company or an industry, the art and creativity falls down the list of priorities. It gets replaced by marketability and what's appealing to demographics. Bob Iger, just like with everything else, took this a step further. Now Disney already exists more as a brand than as a movie company. Today, the only purpose of their movies is to get people into the theme parks and to sell the toys. Everything has to match the Disney image and feel. They even got special permission to change the color of lifeboats on their cruise ships, all to match Mickey Mouse's yellow and black. And under Iger, these parts of Disney's corporate structure have gained more control over the creator's decisions in their movies. Every story is sanitized. Every plot point is controlled. Everything is turned politically correct. It's the reason nearly all modern blockbuster movies seem identical, all using the same CGI and overused cliche stereotypes. Pixar used to make beautiful films based on original concepts. However, after a couple of decades of being under Disney, they mostly now make sequels to those movies, or just change the characters and keep the same story points and message. Today, only the biggest, most well-respected directors like Nolan or Scorsese can even convince studios to make original movies anymore that aren't just a reboot or based on some other property with guaranteed fans and appeal. Modern villains are also an interesting case here. Often they'll begin the movie working towards a sympathetic cause, something that gives power back to the people, or justice for past crimes. The hero then questions their motives and their moral superiority. But then the reveal comes, and it turns out that the villain was just evil all along. That their motive was good, but the way they did things was wrong. This way, Disney and other companies can capture and control ideas that threaten the status quo. The hero and the establishment are always the true protectors of freedom. The villains are just misusing them for their own gain. And Chomsky 
Zelensky's last pillar of propaganda is based on this idea. Ideas that threaten the power structure are equated with the other, an enemy that exists outside of our system and wants to tear it all down. In the past, this was communism and the Red Scare, but today, this is shifting towards something completely new. The villains now act as a justification for a war on terror, both at home and abroad, along with the West's continued intervention in the politics of other countries. They create a vector for people's fear and anger, something they can channel their unrest and dissatisfaction with the system into. Modern movies willingly buy into these ideas, giving us a million different versions of Goldstein to rally against. This would lead to many of the politically correct films that we've seen forced on our faces for at least the last five years. And Bob Iger's work in bringing all these brands and franchises under Disney's control didn't go unnoticed by other titans of the industry. They moved to take control of the rest of the film business. Today, centralized ownership of the media is the worst it's ever been. The film business is controlled by just six companies, Disney, Sony, Viacom, News Corp, Time Warner, and Comcast. These are the companies that own the major studios now, Studios like Paramount and Universal. Of course, they're also part of the wider propaganda machine. Movies like American Sniper and the most recent Top Gun will always get the full support of the US military. I mean, when the original Top Gun released in the 80s, the US Navy actually set up recruiting stations outside cinemas, seeing a huge boost to recruitment numbers across the country. And Paramount's recent version benefited massively from military funding and the use of real hardware and equipment from the military. This is why you see Lockheed Martin's logo everywhere within the movie. The the film is genuinely funded by the military industrial complex, and this film seems to be one of the only films that actually escaped the woke nonsense that is plaguing Hollywood today, and yet even still it was just another victim. I mean the stunts were literally performed by US Navy pilots instead of actors. The only difference in this modern reboot is that the enemy isn't even given a name, as it doesn't really matter who it is, they're just always a foreign power with weapons of mass destruction and modern jets that threatens American freedom, which is likely a product of the US military tampering with the script just like with the Marvel films, they get a free hand to censor anything they don't like. And if you don't believe me, just look into the nudge unit, where the British government intelligence agencies actually go into scripts and rewrite these TV shows for the public, all to plant their little messages. Now, not all of Hollywood's propaganda movies are so general. Zero Dark Thirty is a great example. The movie depicts the gritty drama of the hunt for Bin Laden, but it was entirely censored and rewritten by the CIA. The end result is a movie that downplays the CIA's inhumane, awful interrogation tactics as a necessary tool in taking down America's biggest enemy, not to mention the Patriot Act, which gave America full control to everyone's phone in the country. It also helped that Obama was in hot water for his refusal to shut down Guantanamo Bay, and then the movie released just a month before he was up for re-election. But the propaganda goes far deeper than just movies. The same companies that control the movie studios control the news and the rest of the media as well. In 1983, 90% of the US's media was controlled by around 50 companies. Today, it's just seven. Seven multi-billion dollar conglomerates control pretty much everything people hear and see about the world. And these companies are then controlled by companies like BlackRock and Blackstone who have huge investments in these companies and force them to bow down to their ESG scores, which is why Hollywood is so woke. And Disney is one of the most egregious examples of this, not only in their political pandering, but recently they just bought out the entirety of 20th Century Fox Studios, adding just another huge studio into their massive propaganda machine. And it's blindingly obvious how awful this is for the idea of free press, and it's leading to things like this. First, unfortunately, some members of the media use their platforms to push their own personal bias and agenda to control exactly what people think, and this is extremely dangerous to our democracy. This chilling clip that you just saw was taken from local news channels across the US. Behind it lies Sinclair Broadcast Group, another media juggernaut which owns and controls over 170 local news channels nationwide. It picked up millions of views within days, and it's not hard to see why. It isn't often that media is just so obvious with their thought control. This is the reality of today's echo chamber media, a few different executives controlling everything and making sure everyone marches to the same tune. And this lack of creativity and complete control of the free press has had some very nasty side effects. The studios that have taken control of Hollywood are slowly killing it, with their willingness to take a risk and make something unique. They all tried to copy Disney's model of pumping out identical franchise movies as well, and for a while it was successful. 
Sony's plan for an extended universe based on their Spider-Man movies went nowhere. After the Venom films failed to keep up the momentum, they tried to save the franchise with Morbius. Need I say more? In 2017, Warner Bros tried to turn their new King Arthur movie into a franchise. But when the first film alone lost them over $150 million, it all fell apart. Universal threw their weight behind the Dark Universe, which was meant to link a slew of monster movies together. But when they tried to start it off with a Mummy remake that nobody wanted, it predictably failed. Only DC has limited success in replicating Marvel's overall strategy. But even then, it's a coin flip whether a DC movie will be any good at all. Just look at the two biggest summer blockbusters this year, Oppenheimer and Barbie. Both movies were unique ideas, both of them trying to do something new, and people responded, but will they learn their lesson? Mattel, who owns the rights to Barbie, are already planning a whole Mattel cinematic universe. The new MCU already has 14 more movies planned, all based on different lines of toys. And I bet you can't wait for the next Magic 8 Ball movie, or the Hot Wheels movie, or even the Rock'em Sock'em and Robots film, starring Van Diesel. Barbie made nearly three times the box office returns that the new Mission Impossible did, putting in $155 million in the first three days. Oppenheimer doubled what Warner Bros predicted it would make, pulling in over $80 million in the same time frame. Obviously a Barbie 2 has already been discussed, it's almost like these movies only have two purposes, to make money and spread a narrative. But this model of running a movie studio is already failing. People getting sick and tired of the same movies, the same junk messages, with just new and updated garbage CGI. The closer the studios follow this propaganda model, the more they're losing their audiences and their revenue. Iger's focus on the pillars of propaganda and putting the creativity last is leaving the company in shambles. Disney in particular has lost over $890 million on their past eight studio films. Warner Bros reported a $2.1 billion loss in the last quarter of 2022, and a loss of a little over $1 billion in the first three months of 2023. Paramount Global also lost $1.12 billion in the first quarter of 2023 and at the end of 2022. Sony Pictures' profit margins went down by 86% and their revenue dropped by 42%. And this is all the culmination of a process that's been going on for a long time now. The big movie business is dying. It takes so much time and money to make a big blockbuster movie that it's becoming less and less enticing. Meanwhile, in the last four years, the amount of people going into cinemas has halved. People just aren't bothering to go to the cinema anymore to see an unoriginal action flick or just another remake. Instead, they can just relax at home and watch whatever they want. They can watch the most mind-numbing Subway Surfer TikTok videos or from the plethora of streaming platform content. And it's not even that cinemas are dying though. The Barbenheimer craze has shown that when there's actually a movie worth watching, people will show up. But with how monolithically slow and stupid the studios are, it's hard to see how they'll replicate the success anytime soon. However, studios have responded by putting far more emphasis and pressure on streaming. But it's not the golden egg that they're hoping for. For Bob Iger, this process nearly killed his entire career. When Disney kept releasing flop after flop and their stock price started tumbling, they fired him during the pandemic. But it wasn't the solution Disney were hoping for. After Iger left, nothing changed and the problems with the business model didn't magically disappear. It wasn't long before Disney brought Iger back with another massive pay package. They're hoping he can dig them out of the hole he's dug them into, but it won't work. The problems for Disney are the same as for other corporations who own all of these studios, and these problems aren't going away anytime soon. This is why we're seeing the true death of Hollywood today. These massive, identical blockbusters aren't sustainable in a world where most people just pay a $5 subscription fee rather than visiting the cinema every week. And so as the other sources of revenue keep on plummeting as well, studios are scrambling to squeeze even more money out of their streaming platforms instead. And this also isn't working. For example, streaming subscriptions in the UK fell by 2 million in just 2022, leaving far less money for the studios to fight over. Disney Plus has already lost 4 million subscribers alone in the first three months of 2023. Streaming platforms have also been the main reason behind a drop in advertising revenue. Instant access to content and long unskippable ad breaks don't really go very well together. So studios responded by trying to squeeze even more money out of other places, like their workforce. Maybe if they can replace them with AI or pay them poverty wages, they can keep their leaky ship afloat for a while longer. But that didn't really go so well either. In fact, it's led to a huge writer's strike that has crippled the entire industry at this pivotal moment. You're always writing, and yet they've found a way to make showrunners do double the work and to make and to cut uh, other writers, story editors and staff writers, out of almost all of the paid um, salary. Well, that's resulted in guys not being able to make, make their mortgage, especially the younger writers. And the corporate influence has gotten so bad, and the executives have gotten so greedy, that the entire industry is in revolt. And if this isn't an existential threat to Hollywood, then nothing is. And that's why Hollywood is falling apart. 
and the cracks in the great illusion are beginning to show. The industry is now defined by its own self-satisfaction, along with its moral grandstanding. Actors will follow the same corporate line, giving fake virtue signaling speeches about whatever issues trending this week. Get better when workers of the world unite. Absence is out of respect for the people of my country and those of other six nations whom have been disrespected by the inhumane law that bans entry of immigrants to the US. We have to vote in 2020 and we have to get beg and plead for everyone we know to vote in 2020. This goes out to all those black and brown boys and girls and non-gender conforming who don't see themselves. We're trying to show you, you and us. So thank you, thank you. This is And as we all know, it's always fake. They don't really care about real people, barely any of them do. They're so out of touch, they take videos of themselves singing Imagine from the balcony of their mansion. They may say that I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope someday you'll join us. Or like when Kendall Jenner starred in a commercial where she defused a riot by handing a policeman a Pepsi. We all know all of these people live in their own little world, surrounded by wealth and fame, whilst telling the rest of us that they understand our struggle. Oh, yeah, we see the diamonds. Yes. Um, <laughs> what do you think the value of those diamonds would be? This is about three million. Uh, three million? Yes. Happily going along with this corporate elite liberalism, that's the only acceptable world view in modern show business, because of people like Bob Iger, who have completely stuck the soul out of the entire entertainment industry, instead replacing it with this woke virtue signaling. That's why actors will never touch the harsh realities of their own industry. They brush shoulders with the richest and most powerful people, keeping all of their awful secrets and attending their decadent parties. Predators high up in the film industry itself enjoy relative immunity, all whilst abusing their positions of power, both within Hollywood and across the world. I mean, it took literal decades for Weinstein's crimes to come to light, despite them being common knowledge in show business circles for decades. In fact, Hollywood sees some of the worst treatment of people lower on the ladder than in any other industry. The actor Heath Ledger was found dead today in an apartment here in New York City. He was just 28 years old. Writers face lower wages and shorter contracts, without any promise of future work or employment. Actors that aren't at the very top struggle to make ends meet, victimized by long hours and low pay, being forced to have the same political messaging over and over again, never expressing any individuality. And the Barbie film was a great example of this hypocrisy. Oozing feminist values and commentary on the patriarchy, it goes along with the program messaging that makes advertisers and studios happy. In fact, the movie even acknowledges the role that Barbie and Hollywood have played in distorting young women's body images. The film even suggests that there should be an ordinary Barbie. But then it carries on anyway. Mattel have already released a new line of different Barbies to capitalize on the movie. An ordinary Barbie isn't among them. Of course not. All this virtue signaling and pandering is always completely hollow inside, and people will buy it all up. And however noble the director's and writer's intentions might have been, the movie became a completely politically cliched social commentary that ran straight into the brick wall of consumerism and money that defines modern Hollywood. The modern Hollywood that actually caused the issues that Barbie itself profits from. It's also when you have to live that as a celebrity where you know that every photo of you is analyzed down to like, every eyelash and eyebrow hair and every acne scar and you know that your faults are so people come through everything to find all the faults they can instead of just being like hey this is a healthy nice girl however sometimes the illusion does break when someone says something that they shouldn't and one of the most notable moments of this was ricky gervais's final time hosting the oscars in 2020 ricky gervais would let loose on the ludicrousness of all of hollywood i mean these award shows are the most meaningless and self-satisfied parts of the whole charade and gervais's jokes were the most honest assessment that will ever get out of Hollywood. If you do win an award tonight, don't use it as a, a platform to make a political speech, right? You're in no position to lecture the public about anything. You know nothing about the real world. Most of you spent less time in school than Greta Thunberg. So if you win, right, come up, accept your little award, thank your agent and your god and fuck off. But despite how rotten Hollywood has become, the future might start to look oddly bright for the film industry. I mean, we've seen it all before. During the 60s, the major studios all but collapsed under their own weight. Massive budgets designed to keep out the competition, combined with unoriginal safe films, were what caused their demise and loss of control. Back then, the studios were pumping out massive historical epics by the truckload. However, today, it's superhero films and bloated action blockbusters. 
And as they got further out of touch with people's issues and what they actually wanted to see, the big studios lost their grip on their monopoly, opening the door to riskier independent movies with lower budgets. And without this process, we wouldn't have seen Taxi Driver or The Godfather. Real creativity and art always breaks through in the end, especially in times of struggle. And as Hollywood starts to contract like a dying star, it's these independent voices that will fill the void. 